Hello there and welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover Podcast. I am Vlad, your Bitcoin influencer's influencer, and today I'm interviewing Hampus Haberi, if I said that correctly, who is the lead developer and creator of Blixed Wallet, which is a very cool Bitcoin and Lightning wallet. Hi Hampus, it's really good to have you. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that you dressed up for this interview. It shows that you're trying to be <laughs> professional. Always dressing up, yeah, for sure. And also, I'm going to try to get you out of your comfort zone and maybe get you in trolling mode because I spent some time on your Telegram chat. I'm not much of a lurker or a spy or whatever, but whenever I open it, the Blix wallet chat on Telegram, I see lots of memes. I see lots of shit posting. It's the kind of place where I feel like I'm at home. So congratulations for <laughs> creating this. Yeah, it's a fun, definitely a fun place to be in. Like, it's not only a support chat group; it's also like a good place to have fun in. Yeah, that, that's how you build a Bitcoin community. You post memes, you make fun of whatever is happening in Bitcoin, and also solve problems. That's what building is also about. So, tell me, what is Blixed Wallet, and why does Bitcoin need another wallet? Um, Blix Wallet is um, it's a it's a private LN node wallet. So it's actually like a real Lightning node on your phone. It's actually running like um, the node implementation LND straight up on the phone. Uh, so that has some big like uh, advantages and a lot of flexibility features. So it's uh, it's similar to Breeze and Phoenix and Open Bitcoin Wallet. In the sense that it's a, like a self-custodial uh, Lightning wallet, and uh, we we like have um, a lot of uh, uh, features that lets uh, that that gives a better use experience and easy to use experience for the users. Like we have uh, a feature for automatically creating. Uh, channels when it's needed, like if say let's say they don't have a channel already. You can open one on the fly when you create the invoice and get it gets paid. But there's also a lot of flexibility, like you can also open a channel to your own routing node if you if you have one, so let's say, and also connect to your own like uh, Bitcoin node. So there's a lot of flexibility when you use uh, Bricks Wallet. Uh, for example, we also have. Uh, uh, the ability to read the LND logs inside the app and such. And, and so if you like to tinker around and, and uh, like uh, manipulate things and just check out underneath what's going on in Lightning, you can easily do that in Blixt. But it's also if you just want an easy to use wallet and you don't care about like advanced things, uh, you don't need to do that. Like we don't just put that stuff in your face. You need to actually uh, go in and want to tinker if you need, if you want to. So that's like uh, the overview of Flix, I'll say. Yeah, that's really cool. And you said a lot from which I can unpack. Something which got my attention from what you described is the fact that you can open channels when you receive transactions that are larger than the channels that you already have. I think yes, that's yeah. pretty cool because that's a limitation in Lightning. You can only receive as much as you have in terms of liquidity. And you can yes, only send yes. as much as you can in terms of how large your channels are. So the fact that you can open a channel just to accommodate that transaction is a really nice UX integration. But how does it work? Basically, you create like an invoice uh with some special things to it. And then uh, the Blixt, like it's the, the service is called Dunder. So we have like an LSP Lightning Service Provider that we host for the Blixt project. And basically when when the payment comes to you, uh, Dunder will automatically open a channel towards you and then like settle the payment. So it's like on demand channels that gets created for you when it's needed uh, and so on. So it's a pretty neat way to to get started using Lightning to onboard people. I agree with that. And 
I'm also looking at your page. There are lots of features that you're listing here and many of them, I'm not sure if I've seen them in other wallets. So can you tell me in terms of comparison with, I guess your main competitors, if we can call them competitors, are Breeze, Phoenix, and maybe Moon. What's the difference between Blix and all of these three? Um, I would say, I mean, they're pretty similar, but uh, as we talked about briefly, like uh, in Blix, you have a lot of more of uh, flexibility on what you can do in the wallet. So like we, we have the default mode of operation, which is that uh, you will connect to the Blix uh, node and open channels to that. But if you want to, you can open a channel to whomever you want. You're not like locked into uh, using the node and services that we provide. Uh, you can just open a channel to any node net network or your own routing node in your home. So it's more like a flexible way of using Blix. And a lot of users, they have like one channel to watch the Blix node. And then they also have a channel to watch LN Big or any other node in the network because, yeah, we have that uh, possibility. Uh, and also Blix has uh, good coverage of the LN URL suite with all the different uh, functionality that you ha have available there. Like uh, you can log in to LN Markets and, and Collider and so on, and you can uh, use and send the payments to Lightning addresses and so on. So we try to cover a lot of these things. and. You also have like the ability to easily make uh, keys and the payments in lists, which is uh, keys and is basically a way to make a payment without requiring an invoice beforehand. So we have that we have like a screen and a functionality for doing that pretty easily in list. Okay, uh, I see that you answered the question in a diplomatic way. You did not say, oh, I wish Breeze had this feature because we are so much better than them because we can have this flexible option to do whatever. Like, oh, oh okay, I'm going to make you say only one feature that one wallet doesn't have and you can find it in Blix, but you, you'll have to name it. Um, okay, for example, can in Blix, you can have... Uh... You can set your own uh, name inside Blix. Like I, when I developed Blix, I tried to focus on user experience, for example. So inside Blix, you can set up your own little name, for example, which is, it can just be um, a, like uh, alias or some kind of, it doesn't need to be a real name, but that will be added to your invoice so that uh, the, the payer that pays the invoice will see and can recognize the actual payment in question. Because like, if you look at most uh, like on-chain wallets and Lightning wallets, it's very difficult to, to keep track of the transac transaction log uh, and know what payments has actually been made. So I'm trying to focus on things like this so you can keep track of, uh, of the things you do in the wallet. So a lot of work has been wor done on that part of the uh, wallet. Right. Something that I like about Blix, and I recall this day very vividly, is that when Noster caught up and started blowing up in terms of zaps, most users were turning to Wallet of Satoshi or what's the other one? Albi. And they Albi, were using yeah. them in a custodial way. And immediately you responded in a way that you said, OK, we need to find a way to integrate Blix to enable users of Noster to receive payments without having to set up a node and by using Blix. And the technical challenge there is that you have to be constantly online when you receive a Lightning transaction. So if you have the wallet closed on your phone, you're not going to be able to receive that transaction, but you are able to find a workaround for that as far as I can tell. Yes. Yeah, kind of. Um... Yeah, I have a I have a idea, a concept called a lightning box. So basically, it's it's like a lightning address server. Um, so the, the idea is that when you have an incoming lightning address request, like a payment, uh, the lightning box provider will 
basically send a message to uh, the wallet in the phone and request an invoice back. So it's it's like a uh, like it forwards the request to the phone, so it can answer answer back with an invoice. Uh, so that means that the Lightning box will not uh, take the payment on behalf of the user. It won't be custodial uh, because the invoice of, from the phone is being used. So that's a ne- kind of neat way to work within the like the boundaries that are set. Because uh, like LNRL Pay and Lightning RLS, they require uh, on server. And they require like domains and such. And like most users don't have these things and they usually don't want to deal with it. So I'm trying to give an alternative to completely custodial uh, services here. Um, but as you said, uh, this uh, requires the the wallet app to be like online uh, when the payment comes in, comes, the payment request comes. So like we have an upcoming feature in Blixt that lets the phone app, the Blixt wallet app, always be active, like twenty four seven. It never, it never closes down, so it can always be. It always, it's always available, available to take incoming payments, and it's actually working pretty good. It doesn't take that much toll on the battery life, which is quite neat. So we have like three or four people uh, trying this out right now, and. And uh, are running Blixt Wallet like in a persistent uh, manner, to so it's always online, always active. Yeah, you, you basically foreshadowed my following question, which was about the battery life. As if you keep an application open all the time, it's gonna take a toll on the battery life of your phone. But you already answered that the impact is not as great. Yeah, it's it's it takes a toll on the battery life, but it's not as dramatic as you may think it is it's it works fine and it kind of matters a bit if you're on if you're on the wi-fi and so on then it takes no toll at all basically but if you're using 4g and or 5g it drains uh, more battery than than over wi-fi but still like if you have a, a modern phone it's it's quite fine in my experience like i have been using blixt on a persistent mode for one month now, I think, and it's working good. It's it's definitely feasible to, to do this. Yeah, so I know that the guys from Samurai listen to my show from time to time just to extract clips and make fun of me on their chats. But I wish that they learn from you because by default, you're using BIP 157, which is Neutrino. And you also yes. allow users to co- connect their own nodes, which means that you connect no you collect no XPUBs. You don't know anything about your users' transactions. That is true. Yes. Yeah, okay. it's it uh, kind of matters though because, like, if you it depends on how you use Blixt because if you connect to uh, if you open channels with the Blixt uh, Lightning node, then I know about those uh, channels, of course. But you're not forced to do that. Like, you can just open channels to whoever whoever you want to. And in that case, uh, we like I have no idea about your transactions then, like uh, because as you said, we we're using the Neutrino BIP 157 uh, SPV mode, which basically means that uh, the the SPV server, the the node that's serving the information to the wallet, does not know about the w- wallet transactions and addresses. So 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 that's like a pr- privacy enhancing. Uh, thing. Yeah, and I appreciate that you have it. And it also says here on your website that you can use Blixt as an on-chain wallet. And if you use it as an on-chain wallet, it's pretty private for a mobile phone application. For, for sure, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, it's it's also like an on-chain wallet, uh, Blixt. But the primary focus um, is, of course, to use it for Lightning. But you could use it for on-chain as well, like if you want to. Yeah. Do, do you also have a Tor integration? Uh, yes. Yeah. There is like a built-in torrent functionality. So even more privacy, like uh, focused people uh, should enable that one. Um, and that means that all Bitcoin and Lightning traffic will be tunneled over Tor. 
and you can also connect to to the Blix, the nodes, and Onion service as well. That we have. Is there an option to set another type of proxy, like a VPN or some other server that you might own? Uh, no, well, depends on the Android stuff, I think. But there's no like um, things inside the Blix to to deal with that. No. Is there a difference between? Okay, so uh, I should also make this mention before I ask the question. Right now, Blix Wallet is available on the Google App Store, and you can also yes sideload it from the GitHub repository. So you, you don't tell Google that you are running the app, even though they might know because they surveil and whatever. But on the iPhone, the application is in test flight mode. So it's not deployed yes. in the App Store yet. It's still being tested and scrutinized by the Apple people. Also by yes, the users yes. who are sending feedback. I don't know, when does that one come out on the iPhone? Um. It will probably take some time because uh, we have some uh, weird uh, crashes of cell phones and devices that I need to deal with, and it's it's kind of it's kind of good to have it in like test flight because uh, then it's more like uh, users understand it is more like a still in like a beta phase. So we'll probably have that for quite some time. I think um, I, I don't I don't have any plans to to release it to the uh, App Store fully. Uh, so, but if you have an iPhone and want to use Blixt, I will just rec recommend you to install TestFlight and, and download Blixt from there, uh, because it is still uh, pretty stable, but uh, I don't feel comfortable with releasing it fully right now. But it, it should be fine under normal circumstances, and we have people using Blixt on a daily basis, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see about that later on. Yeah, so the question that I, I was about to ask before I made this side note concerns something rather technical about privacy of your connection. What is the difference between installing Orbot, which is a third party Tor implementation that allows you to route certain transact, not transactions, certain applications through a Tor connection? And having Tor enabled directly in Blix Wallet, is there a technical difference in there? Um, not that I know of. I think it's pretty similar. I will say the difference is more of a convenience thing. Like, if you don't have Orbot installed, then it's pretty convenient to just enable uh, Tor integration inside Blixt. So I would say it's a convenience thing uh, right now. But yeah, but yeah. It, it's still cool that you have it. Yeah, and also we'll try to. I don't think we have full Orbot support right now, but it is in the like it's, it is in the short term things to do to support Orbit as well. Uh, but right now we usually just enable uh, Tor inside uh, the wallet instead, which is neat. For a while, my favorite mobile wallet, and this has been since 2018 or 2019, my favorite mobile wallet for Lightning has been Blue Wallet. And I enjoyed the flexibility that it provided that I connect, I could connect my Electrum server, my Lightning node, I could run some Vault features, I could connect a hardware wallet. It was super great. But as far as I can tell, it's not being maintained as much. And also they are dropping support for the custodial Lightning side, which was also pretty convenient in some situations. So would you say that Blixt is taking over what used to be the core audience for Blue Wallet? Um, I wouldn't say so because like Blue Wallet, as you said, is custodial. Um, I'm not sure where, where they're moving actually. I think they're moving to Wallet of Satoshi probably. Um, I think uh, Blixt core audience is right now. It's probably people from like a simple Bitcoin wallet, the the uh, the app that a guy called Anton developed. Um, and also probably new people, like new testers and uh, thinkers people. Um, and maybe probably also some people from uh, Breeze and Phoenix that is uh, moving and testing out Blixt. I think there's overlap from everywhere. Um, but probably also some people that are moving from Moon because they realize that Moon isn't a, 
really a lightning wallet. It's basically an on-chain wallet with lightning functionality. Uh, because if you do bigger payments in Moon, you need to do an on-chain transaction as well. And if the fee, if the on-chain fees are high, then the lightning payment will will also have a high fee, which doesn't make sense as lightning is supposed to be for like small payments with having low fees. So there's probably some people moving from Moon to Blixt as well, uh, because Blixt is like it's a real lightning wallet in one sense. So. All right. So if you had the members of my audience in the elevator with you and you had about 30 seconds to explain to them why they should be using Blixt, what would you tell them? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, well, I will say that like, if you're a Bitcoiner uh, that wants to use Lightning and wants to try out Lightning, then Blix is a good choice because it presents Lightning in a easy and welcoming manner. But when you want to start to learn how it works underneath, you have it available at your fingertips to just go and click, press around inside Blix. So it's easy to get up and get started, but you have a lot of possibilities when you want to go deeper, so to say. Are you concerned that your friends, neighbors or KYC exchange might know how much Bitcoin you own? It is time to take your financial privacy seriously with Wasabi Wallet a free and open source wallet solution which makes use of mega coin joins to mix your coins with those of hundreds of other strangers. Thanks to the groundbreaking Wabi Sabi engine, your coins get divided in smaller untraceable units which grants you great anonymity for both huddling and spending. Download Wasabi Wallet 2.0 today at wasabiwallet.io and take advantage of the mega coin joins. It's free and it's open source, so don't trust Verify. CryptoSteel are innovators in Bitcoin cold storage. Back in 2013, they launched the CryptoSteel cassette, which made it easy to back up your seed phrase, passphrase, or any other form of private key on the sturdy metal which resists water, fire, and earthquakes. Today, CryptoSteel offers the Mother Load, an all-in-one box which endows you with everything you need to become financially sovereign. Inside of the Mother Load, you get a crypto steel capsule and a hardware wallet of your choice. All crypto steel products are engineered and manufactured in Poland. Order your crypto steel metal backup system today on cryptosteel.com and use promo code BTCTKVR at checkout for a 10% discount on your first order. Crypto steel, secure your wallet seed phrase. Are you a writer, photographer, musician, or video creator who is trying to generate some revenue? Bumby is the Bitcoin way to monetize your content. It's more censorship resistant than any other platform of its kind, with a low and flat one-time fee of 10%. Bumby is as easy to use as any social media mobile application. Sign up today at Bumby.com and subscribe for free to the Bitcoin Takeover account to get access to some time-exclusive content. If you are monetizing your creativity, why not get paid in Bitcoin for it? Bumby.com, the Bitcoin way to monetize your content. Shopping with your Bitcoin on the internet is easy. Shopinbit is Europe's biggest Bitcoin store with over 800,000 products, ranging from Bitcoin books, toothpaste, mobile phones, computers, and watches. 
This month, I bought a Nintendo Game & Watch console with the classic Legend of Zelda, and it arrived in only 5 working days. And if you can't find what you're looking for, Shopping Bit has got you covered. Their concierge service will get you anything and ship it worldwide. Additionally, they also have a travel hacking service that can get you the best deals on all things travel. Flights, hotels, and more. For business and for vacations. Bitcoin Takeover listeners get a nice discount, of course. Use code BTCTKVR on your first order for a one-time 5 euro discount. For more details, go to shopinbit.com. Shop in Bit, Europe's biggest Bitcoin store. All right, Hampus. So let's talk about the stuff that's not yet in Blixt Wallet, but you want to put it there. What's on the roadmap? Um, upcoming here in the coming re versions is the persistent uh, mode. So that Blixt is always like active on Android to 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 sync the chain and so on. But together with that, I'm also planning to have like a private beta of the lightning box uh, service so that uh, users for the first time can have a self-custodial mobile wallet that can receive via a lightning address because like right now on Noster and a lot of places uh, you basically have to use a custodial lightning address or you will have to uh, host your own routing node and run your own lightning address server. So I'm planning to have like a, a beta of the lightning box service uh, in the in April probably. Uh, so if you're interested in joining, join my Telegram and tell me. Uh, so that's that's like in the intermediary here. That will be the upcoming thing. And later on, I'm also working on having Dixed Wallet for desktop. Uh, OSS like uh, right now we have Blixt for Android and iOS, and but we also Mac OS. But I also want to have it for Windows and Linux because, like when I, I like I think it's a good idea to have uh, a Lightning wallet on the desktop as well. Like uh, uh, so you can just click on the the uh, the invoice code and it will just automatically open a wallet on on your uh, on your computer instead of having to scan something so because there aren't really any alternatives right now for doing that like there's no uh, i think there is like electrum will be the only lighting wallet for desktop right now so i'm planning to to port Blixt to desktop as well. So we have that. I think that Electrum does something very interesting with trampolines. And that's yeah. a technology that comes from Async's, what's it called? Async, yeah, A-C-I-N-Q. Yes, yeah. Which is, I guess, the third biggest Lightning developer right now. Yeah. So. What that does, I, I've had Thomas Vogtlin from Electrum on the podcast last year, and he explained to me that it's a very good way to make your wallet work like a wallet. So you don't have to maintain channels and stuff like that. You only send payments when you need to and receive when you need to. And that's all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's um, like uh, Blix, for example, and other like lightning node wallets. For the phone, they have they have to maintain the channel graph or channel database with all the channels, right? And that is quite uh, burdensome and bloaty. Um, but it works. Like Blixt does a full graph sync, for example. Um, so yeah, as you said, like the idea with trampoline right routing is that you outsource the the work to find like a path to the destination, like the receiver to another party and uh, so they will do the pathfinding for you and that that makes the wallet more lightweight and so on so yeah that's some, definitely something we're looking for Blixt as well um, 
there is potential privacy problems with that though because like the the service that you uh, use will know like the path uh, for the to the destination uh if you just use one trampoline there's actually a fix for this and that is to use like two trampolines one trampoline that goes to another trampoline and then that one goes to the target destination uh, so that's that's definitely an interesting thing to 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 look forward for in the future yeah but for that i guess you would have to move away from l d right um yeah or develop trampoline for l d um i know there is like an issue on github regarding this topic so like l d doesn't have support for trampoline right now but as far as i understand uh they're looking into trampoline which is quite good because that that will of course benefit uh, me a lot if we have that like at least long term because like blix will try to use source routing as much as we can like and source routing means that you you on the phone finds a path to the receiver but as uh, as lightning grows larger and bigger it might not be feasible anymore for a phone to do this on the device right so um so if that's the case then we might need to move to trampoline routing as well in the long term but as it stands right now it's fairly quick and fast to find find paths on the phone uh, so that's not a problem like the peer-to-peer -peer gossip network where you actually like send the channel announcements and stuff and updates it's quite uh, uh bloaty and so on but actually finding a path to the destination node is not a huge burden right now as far as i can tell um so yeah that's how it is so something that i should have asked you sooner but i should ask you anyway concerns the fact that you're working full-time on this lightning wallet project which is called blix and do you do it because you're developing stuff that you wish you discovered in other places yourself or are you targeting a certain type of use cases? Um, like I, not sure if I can answer the question, but yeah, I try to, like I want to use Blixt myself. So I'm, I'm mostly developing uh, Blixt the way I want it to look and so on. And it seems like that has uh, worked out so far because people seem to enjoy Blixt, but I'm trying to see it from like what I will personally want to use instead of a hypothetical uh, user. So, so yeah. Yeah, I think it's really great because the first time when I tried Lightning Network in June or July of 2018, it was very convoluted. You needed to type in some command line stuff. I burnt my SSD doing that during my sync. And it was not intuitive. It was very hard to see how that would be the future of payments. And even I think it was about seven months later when I received my Casa node, it seemed like that was the future and that was going to be easy, but it really wasn't. There were so many features missing. It was not convenient at all. And there was a lot of work that was needed. So the fact that today you can run a mobile application, which offers you a non-custodial experience with Lightning and also a pretty private one. I think that's incredible. We've come really far. And I think after this point, we can finally seek to scale Lightning Network and make it whatever it was intended to be. I'm not sure if it was intended for microtransactions or for large transactions. You have different school of thoughts for that, but I'm happy that it's finally working the way it was promoted yeah, in the sure. beginning. For sure yeah like uh, as we talked about like blixt also had some other roles like open bit wallet of v by fiat Jeff and breeze and phoenix like they are actually you there is actually a lightning node in the phone and uh, i think that is the probably the way to go and perhaps outsource some stuff like the routing to the trampoline service but it's, it's if even if you do that it's still like a lightning node in the phone, even if you outsource certain things. And I think I think that is the way to go. Um, it's really nice that we have come so far uh, right now, because uh, I there's a lot of people that seems to have this misunderstanding 
that you need that you should be a routing node to use lightning like having an umbrella and so on and being like routing payments but really i think most users should probably just use a lightning wallet on the phone instead and because it's like a private lightning node instead of being like a routing node in the network uh, because i foresee that like routing node will go the path of mining it will become a specialization so like it will be like a professional industry in the end right now it's kind of wild west but in the long run it will be similar to mining i i think actually well maybe not similar to mining because that one requires powerful hardware and also a lot of energy consumption but it yes, does but it will be similar in the sense that it's like a professional like it, it's a competitive industrial thing right it won't you'll probably have like um, uh, plevnet still running and that's that's good i actually like that but it will also become more you know reliable and stuff and stuff so there will be like two parallel networks in one uh if that makes sense yeah i think two or three years ago everyone was trying to become a routing node with a raspberry pi and in my yeah. experience so i still have this i keep it as a memory of my attempts this one died and it, it wasn't pleasant and the fact that i was routing everything through tor has only made it slower and lesser reliable i used to have a lot of failed payments with it and i used to think okay so i'm running a node and yet it's not as reliable as i would want for myself not just for everyone else and there was yeah. also this meme at the time when I started running a lightning node, a routing node, that you would be able to sustain the energy costs from the fees that you're collecting, which really wasn't true. It never turn, turned out to be true. Sometimes I would r route like 30, 40 transactions a month. And that, you know, even when Bitcoin goes to $1 million, that's still kind of a stretch. Yeah, yeah. I think I saw some tweet today that like seventy percent of the network is uh, only available over Tor, um, or maybe Tor and IP. But most of those nodes are probably like Raspberry Pi nodes, Lightning nodes. Um, and uh, the thing is that uh, it kind of causes some issues for reliability because. Those nodes are only available over Tor, and Tor has been under constant denial of service attacks for, I think, a year now, or maybe more. Uh, so the, the issue is that it causes issues for people actually trying to use uh, Lightning as a payment network. Because if you stumble upon uh, a node when you're making a payment that is slow, like you basically have to wait for it to respond. So if it takes like 10 seconds for the for the node to respond, uh, that make, makes so that payments be slow in general. So that's why Lightning can sometimes be slow because there are just nodes in the network that, that the, is slow to respond. Yeah, I also wrote an article to explain Lightning to 10 year olds that that's the principle of it not necessarily i did not intend it to be read by 10 year olds but my, the way that i explained it at the time was that basically every node is an island and you need to build bridges between islands with the special note that when you build a bridge with someone and it's you who builds the bridge then you can send whatever you want money resources in this case it's bitcoin but in the island case you can use the road to get to that island yourself. But if you want that same island to get to you, it needs to build a road to your island. And this this is the way that the network scales and it extends. But I think nowadays with these mobile wallets that open channels for you and do all of this interesting stuff in the background, the explanation became a lot more intricate. And right. yeah. yeah, is there any channel man management that's required in Blixt? Do you need to use your channels unless you don't want them to close? Um, like you can do some channel management in Blixt, but it's like in the normal mode of operation, 
I try to make it so you don't have to do that, right? Because uh, if you just want to use the wallet, then Blix will hook you up with the with the Blix node, and you shouldn't you shouldn't have to care uh, that much about it. But uh, if you want to, you could tinker around and and uh, open channels to your own routing and stuff, like we talked about. Uh, so I try to minimize uh, like channel management and liquidity management management as much as possible. Uh, but you can still, like Blix is pretty open, so you can still go and see your channels pretty easily, and you can close them and so on. But it's not, I'm trying to make it easy for the user here, basically. So, yeah. Yeah, there is this trade-off, I guess, between making it absolutely sovereign and making it very easy to use. And I think I finally got the point of the Lightning Network when I was inscribing ordinals and I was using Lightning payments for it because I could pay a lot of on-chain transactions and pay a lot of fees, or I could pay to a service provider lightning transactions that were faster. And I would make, for example, only one on-chain transaction to fill the wallet with Bitcoin and then That's make good. five lightning transactions, which were saving a lot of block space. Because otherwise, I, I know that the inscriptions were on-chain and the third party was actually making on-chain transactions, but I actually saved some on-chain transactions right. just yeah. by doing this. No, I, mean, I think it makes full sense to to use like a service that will make the on-chain on-chain inscription, but you pay it in Lightning because, like, like that's that's basically what Lightning is, is for, right? You can you should be able to do these payments in question, and uh, you also have the reliability factor, and it's just instant and so on. So. It's pretty neat use case, I think. Yeah, there's so much cool stuff that's happening. And it's cool to see that Bitcoin is scaling and is finally having a more competitive fee market. There's a lot that gets me excited about Bitcoin right now. But there's also stuff that I don't like about what's going on. And you also mentioned that you don't always share the more popular opinions. So let's get to the unpopular opinion section. All right. So what is super mainstream about Bitcoin, but you disagree with it? Um, probably the, like there's like a, a pretty prevalent opinion that Bitcoin is just perfect or just fine the way it is. Uh, and I, I don't agree with that at all. Like, um, like when Satoshi first created Bitcoin, he wanted to solve the double spending problem, the Byzantine generals problem. And he did that by like doing a, like a ledger, like a blockchain together with proof of work. Like that's how he solved the, the double spending problem. But like people were quick to point out that it's not like a perfect design because he, he couldn't create a perfect design from the beginning because otherwise, like otherwise, if you try to make something perfect from the get-go, it will just take forever. So. He tried to solve the primary issue here, which is fixing double spending in a decentralized distributed network. So, so like uh, people pointed out that there is some scaling problems and there is some privacy problems with Bitcoin, and uh, and that's why we probably should try to uh, make Bitcoin better because it's not perfect and it was never perfect at all. It's like you cannot do software that is perfect from the get-go. Uh, I think I think the design of Bitcoin, like with proof of work and the blockchain and so on, is uh, sound and correct. But it's it did not fix all the problems from the beginning, and it's basically the same with Noster as well. Like Fiat Jeff wanted to solve censorship resistant uh, social media. But there are also some issues with scaling there as well and so on, because you cannot fix everything at once. So, so that is why I think that we should still pursue uh, like soft forks and updates to Bitcoin, because it is not perfect the way it is, and we should uh, we should try to improve it. Not only that, but if you look at the version that Satoshi launched back in 2009, it was far from perfect. It received so many optimizations. The first version of oh, sure. Bitcoin actually had a game of poker that was integrated in it, which was later removed. That is true, yeah. 
there were so many quirky features that it had and there were so many optimizations that were added after satoshi had left and for example satoshi in his original design had this how should i put it equal role of node and miner the separation oh, yeah. of That's validating nodes and miners that is was made one. later Right, yeah. That's that's an interesting one because that's also like the core issue with the small blocker versus big blocker debate a bit because they interpret miners and nodes that's the same, but the small blocker team basically see them as separate things, uh, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's a very interesting thing. And uh, yeah, as you said, like satoshi needed to create everything at once right he needed to make sure that you have the mining you have the full node and so on so that's why it was it was all baked into one single uh, program but as time goes on like uh, things usually split up and gets specialized so so that's why full nodes and miners are separate right because uh, miners run a lot of other software other than Bitcoin Core today, like there is no there's no miner in Bitcoin Core right now because like they use their own specialized specialized software. So yeah, so that's probably why the conflict started because Satoshi has had to create everything at once and he has made it to one big blob basically. Yeah, that that's very true. And he, so for some reason he gets portrayed as this alien or time traveler or genius who came out of nowhere and designed this, but he was very much a flawed human being. And you can read the forum posts, you can read to see what kind of person he was based on his interactions. And you're going to see that he didn't have everything figured out. For sure. I, I, think, I, think the, a lot. I think the, I think the, I think the actual proof of work and difficulty adjustment and the, like the, the overall design is pretty pretty genius in general but as you said it's there are a lot of issues and and that's that's normal because he he was a human after all he's a human no one is perfect so it makes sense that the software wasn't perfect either and so but people should have that in mind when they think about bitcoin i think yeah, and there were at least two instances from the white paper where he was wrong he was wrong yes, about true, so. privacy in the privacy section he describes generating a different address for every transaction, which to his credit, he actually did with the coins that he mined. You don't find them in one address, you find them across multiple addresses, and it's very difficult to prove that they even belong to him and it wasn't some other miner. Yeah. And he was also wrong about mining pools, which is something that he saw during his time managing the Bitcoin project. He saw how right. Slush created the Czech mining pool, which later ended up being called Slush Pool. And he saw how his model of one CPU, one vote ended up getting a bit changed as miners figured out that it's probably better for them to receive predictable rewards as opposed to trying to get everything at once. And nowadays, yeah. most of the mining, more than 90% is done with pools. Right. He also got another thing wrong in the white paper and the implementation, which I learned from Peter Todd. I'm not entirely sure exactly how it works, but he thought that the longest chain is the like the real chain, so to say. But it's actually wrong. It's actually the chain with the most uh, accumulated work that is the the chain you should follow. And that is that is actually a critical flaw in the design, which was fixed. Uh, sometime in 2010 or 2011, I think. The chain with the most work is the one that we follow rather than the longest chain. Yeah, it makes sense because you can fork Bitcoin and then have a very low mining difficulty and pop, co pop blocks basically get them very fast before the adjustment or remove the adjustment entirely and whatever, generate lots of blocks. It doesn't mean that it's the real chain because it doesn't have as much proof of work. Right. That actually makes sense. But yeah, the Bitcoin Cash people, they they argued for a while that they had more blocks mined 
they were at a higher block height and they were using that to say that they are the longest proof of work chain when in fact there right. were fewer miners working on their chain it was mostly bitmain right yeah yeah so it's it's still most the, the shame with the most work is the one you 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 should follow and you have to follow um and going back to Satoshi, he announced back in November 2008, actually it was October, but in November he received the first reply to the introduction of what he called Bitcoin P2P eCash paper. And James A. Donald was the first person to respond to Satoshi's proposal. And he said, I understand your proposal. It does not seem to scale to the required size. So th this right, was basically yeah. a few days after he, right. uh, after Satoshi yeah. published his proposal. The first guy who responded on the cryptography mailing list said, this doesn't scale. And what he yeah. said afterwards, so I'm, I'm skimming through the comment right now. So he said for transferable proof of work tokens to have value, they must have monetary value. To have monetary value, they must be transferred within a very large network. For example, a file trading network akin to BitTorrent. This sounds so much like Lightning. Right, yeah. It's a very li large file network akin to BitTorrent. Is that not what Lightning is? That's interesting. And I, I think uh, I mean, he's, he is right as well that, that blockchains doesn't scale because they don't they don't scale very well so uh, that is true and, and this was my point earlier that when satoshi put out bitcoin it was not perfect because it couldn't be perfect because satoshi primarily focused on uh the double spending issue like fixing that so basically he had, he had to convince the people either by if he believes in it himself or not that uh, the inv invention works but uh, people seem to believe him, and now, after so many years, we are trying to find and we are finding and we have new solutions like Lightning, for example, which helps for scaling. It's not the end all be all, but it is dramatically better for scaling than on chain. So we should try to continue build upon the foundation that the Bitcoin on chain layer and the Lightning layer has provided for us. Yeah, I very much agree with that. But we should not worship Satoshi as this time traveling alien or try to For make sure, up yeah. stuff about him and presume that he was correct. And also argue for ossification of something which is imperfect. In my view right now, right. we need at least two hard forks. And I say need, not want. We're going to need one whenever quantum computing becomes a threat. And that can be in 20, 25 years. And we also need one to fix a signature issue that's going to happen by the end of the century. I'm not. I mean, the timestamp. Uh, yeah, 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 that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. But also, I think um, there's also this. I'm not an expert in this area, but there is a bug regarding the difficulty adjustment. Like uh, it's called a time warping bug. And it essentially lets miners. Uh, quickly mine all the remaining Bitcoin for them, like immediately, basically, because there's like an off by one bug in the calculation of the difficulty retargeting uh, algorithm. So, and that requires a, a hard fork to fix. So, uh, and that is, it's kind of like a security threat to Bitcoin, actually. So, I will actually say that we need three hard forks. Uh, Maybe we can have also. only one and change this. Yeah, that's. There was this idea of having like the big, the big hard fork to fix all the issues. Uh, I think Matt Corallo was the the author of that like proposal, but as far as I understand, it never went anywhere. Yeah, and I guess it's a lot more dangerous to change so much at once. It's it is, probably better true. to make small changes and see how stuff adapts. Yeah, Maybe. for sure, and. I mean, I think like hard forks is quite interesting, but I think uh, to make it in a safe manner, it should probably like be a flag day, like long in the future, like let's say three years or five years in the future, so that most, if not all, 
uh, full loads have but by that point like updated i think that will be the best way to to do hard forks if we're going to do it uh, so let's say yeah i get the point of austrian economists who got into this space thinking that bitcoin is the new gold and they I think this is also Satoshi's fault because he's the one who in the white paper described mining just as finding gold. But yeah, they are the ones who don't really spend much time trying to understand the code, but have expectations about having something that doesn't change, which makes sense. I, I'm also conservative. I don't want to make very rapid right. changes. We have seen how SegWit and Taproot led to ordinal inscriptions, and that was like a side effect that nobody saw, except for one guy, um, and that was enough. I don't think that's, I, I think that most of the like Bitcoin uh, devs and Bitcoin core devs, they probably knew about it, but they didn't know if people will actually go ahead and do these, these kind of things. Uh, because there are, I think Peter Todd even has a script for normal legacy addresses to do these things. I think it's mostly like, uh, the trade-off was worth it to 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 realign the UTXO incentives because um, like block space is not really the primary scaling scaling concern. It's actually the UTXO database, which uh, like because that needs to be readily available for for full nodes. Because if if you spend a UTXO, you need to be able to quickly find it. So if that grows too large, then it becomes a, a major scaling uh, problem for Bitcoin uh, full nodes. And there are some proposals to fix this, like the, the U3XO uh, proposal, which basically it reverses the burden of knowing about the UTXO. So the spender of the UTXO needs to provide proof that it exists basically instead of all the full nodes having the UTXO database hot available. So say. I agree, but I guess that the four megabyte limit imposed by SegWit is somewhat reasonable, is it not? Um, well, I will, yeah, it's, it's reasonable for sure. Um, I will actually say that uh, there is something called the cross input signature aggregation. Which basically lets you, like, if you if you have like a new TXO where you have your Bitcoin on, to spend that new TXO, you need to provide a signature, right, to that new TXO. So, and if you have two new TXOs, you need to provide two signatures for each for one for the both for the both of new TXOs. But cross input signature aggregation lets you do one Schnorr signature over multiple uh, UTXOs to spend multiple outputs so that i think that will be a better fix than to discount input data that segwit does so if we can get cross input signification i will probably be for either lowering the discount or just flat out removing it because that will also mean that ordinal inscriptions play on a fair they play a fair game then because like ordinal inscriptions use 99 percent input data and then one percent output data, so they are a lot cheaper, let's say, than a real like a real transaction, like where the split is basically fifty percent input, fifty percent output. Yeah, what do you think is the reasonable amount of time that needs to pass in terms of testing until something is considered safe to be merged into the main Bitcoin core code? Um, I think it depends on uh, the like the scope of the matter as well, right? Because if you look at something like Sighash and the out, which is a soft fork that lets us uh, basically it improves lightning quite a lot, and you can also do like covenant vaults and so on. Uh, but that that the code for that is pretty small. Like it's it's very trivial in the lines of code that is needed for the consensus critical parts and that ha like and the private has been discussed for many 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 years now like uh, it's it's well known and so on so uh at i think at least two or three years it has been discussed so i will say that and there's no like 
contention about the software as well, as far as I understand. Like most people seem to be okay with it. It's it's not controversial to so to say. So I think same, something like Sigvers and Approve Out will probably be a good candidate for soft forking into Bitcoin, uh, just like we have done in the past, because like the, the benefits seems pretty clear to me there. Um, and for we also have like a new proposal to make covenant vaults called OP the OP vault code uh, so fork, and that is pretty recent, right? It was I think it was announced in January or February, uh, I think around that time at least. Um, but it has also been fairly non-controversial and stuff. But uh, I will say that it probably maybe needs some more time, maybe one year or six months more time. Uh, but as I also checked the code for that proposal, and it's also pretty trivial in my opinion, at least. Uh, it's it's more code and more things than any priv out. But uh, as a soft fork, I think it's it the scope is right and the practical use cases are also clear to me. So that will be a soft fork I will be definitely for. Yeah, I was just thinking right months. now that if the listeners of other podcasts where Bitcoin gets praised as this perfect perfect invention, listen to us right now, for some reason, by accident, they end up here. They're going to be like, oh, these shit coiners, they're so bad. They don't want this project to succeed and whatever. Yeah. Changes destroyed Bitcoin, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, yeah. Um, but it, yeah. It's not a further going. Like it's it's kind of like a new culture in general, I think, in Bitcoin. Like uh, it's a bit technophobic, like, right? Because I've seen a lot of people that are like uh, they're against or afraid to change it of Bitcoin, which I can understand to a point because like if we mess this up, like it's over basically, in my opinion at least. So we need to be really careful. But at the same time, that shouldn't be used as an argument to not do anything at all because that's also like a concern in the long run if you just stay stagnant. I, I really think, especially if the things like Covenant and so on, and vaults that can be used to like secure custody of Bitcoin, like in a secure manner. I think those things should be pretty non-controversial if we have like a competent and good soft fork to, to use. And for example, any pre out and OP vault are two OP codes that would uh, enable practical uh, covenant. So yeah, this seems to be a shift in in the culture and message surrounding how we think about Bitcoin. Because like I remember back in 2014, um, where the 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 opinion in general was most like you see all these uh, altcoins having functionality and. Like the, the the opinion was basically like if they have something of value, Bitcoin would or should or both uh, soft fork that into Bitcoin as well, or hard fork. Probably soft fork is is a safer path. But right now it seems like the the opinion has shifted for a lot of people that Bitcoin is just perfect the way it is, and I don't agree with that opinion at all. Like uh, there is a lot of things that we should improve if we can. Uh, uh, because software is rarely finished in that way. Like software always evolves, and like ossification comes naturally by a decentralized network. Like you can't change TCP/IP anymore because it's so rooted into internet itself. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't see like maybe yeah, if you have to DNS server, like that's also rooted in rooted in internet itself. But if we could improve it, we probably should. But we really can't because it's so so like uh, deep now in the in the internet that it's difficult to to change. Uh, and the same applies to Bitcoin, right? Uh, like uh, uh, ossification will come when we have really reached real decentralization. Right, Hampus. But we should also talk about how the Bitcoin the Bitcoin culture has changed. You mentioned something about 2014. And I guess the average user was a lot different back then than right now. The expectations were different. Sure. I guess back then it wasn't about going to 100K no matter what the price is. And by price, I don't mean US dollar cost. I mean 
making concessions and giving up on potentially sovereignty just for the purpose of pumping the price or whatever. Back then, right. there were more nerds. There were more idealists than people for waiting sure. to go to the moon. For sure. Like, I remember back in 2014, we had the sidechain white paper by Blockstream can release the stuff. And that was like the platform then was uh, Reddit and probably Bitcoin Talk, but I was there on Bitcoin Talk. But there were a lot of discussion on Reddit, like, and people were excited for um, improvements to Bitcoin and so on. And I don't like, there is still a technical community, but it's, it seems to be very like uh, separated from the the general like uh, bitcoin uh, audience let's say i don't really have to explain the but you know it's 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 not like uh, it was before because back in back then i could just like talk with uh, gregory maxwell or any core dev and so on very easily and so on so, but now now it seems like it's very distant from the users now, and at least online, so to say. Uh, so that's definitely a change in in how we communicate. Because I think that the move to Twitter has been, in some ways, uh, a, a, a bad one for for these kinds of things uh, and so on. Because it doesn't allow for technical discussions in a good way we still have the mailing list and so on but it's it's fairly fringe and so so yeah definitely changes uh, in the perception and the view of bitcoin nowadays i think that the whole scaling debate and the block size wars happened mostly because there was this disconnect between the core devs and what the businesses wanted and For at sure. one point, yeah. the businesses just said, we're going to fork off and create our own and move what we think is more valuable to a new chain. And they failed, obviously, because they did not understand what Bitcoin is and they made the wrong bet. But I guess also part of the issue is that there was no proper bridging explanation between the two sides. I guess they did not talk enough. They wanted stuff to move fast. Segwit yeah. was kind of rushed from this point of view, and it was um, in some ways, yeah, for sure. I, and, I think uh, some people regret the fact that we increased the block size with Segwit, but at the time it seemed like something that's worth doing. And also, I don't know. I agree with you. It was easier to reach out to core developers back in the day. They were even on Reddit or Twitter, yeah. and they would reply immediately now yes, there's a disconnect yeah. and the consequence is that we have these marketers like dan held or whatever and they yeah. talk about all the positives of bitcoin and they make you believe that it really is what it technically probably probably is not yeah and raises the For expectations sure. about it being perfect already and then the average user sees a proposal that might be very sound it might make a lot of sense to improve Bitcoin, but they're going to oppose it on principle. Right. And I yeah. think this cultural shift came in 2018. I think Giacomo Zucco's speech from the Baltic Honey Badger about everything that every attempt to change Bitcoin is a scam, everything that is not Bitcoin is a scam. And there was a third one, but I don't recall it correctly. But I think that caused a cultural shift in the community. And I think part of the yeah. toxicity in terms to experimentation started around that time. And everyone who got onboarded afterwards came into this culture of saying, yeah, Bitcoin doesn't need this. It used to be about right. Bitcoin can do this too. But now we're saying Bitcoin doesn't need to do this because we are yeah. sound money. And well, this kind of argument do this. Yeah. indirectly encourages people who want to do something else to move on to shit coins. Which, which is paradoxical because on one hand you bash them and you say that they're terrible and they should not exist. But on the other hand, if you want to do that on Bitcoin, they say, no, you should not use Bitcoin like that. Then, okay, where, where do we find our point of agreement? Yeah, it's, it's like, a, it seems like a 
change in how or it's like a separate kind of maximalism as well then because like uh, when i look in the altcoin space i see basically just shit coins and scams but i think there might be some technical technical aspects of some coins that might be worth look at and just because they are on a shit coin shouldn't really matter if the technology itself is sound we can take mimble wimble for example or or even like uh, uh, roll-ups that the term doing is doing. I don't think the roll-ups really scales that well for Bitcoin, but I also uh, I still think that we should look into that and not be like uh, uh, against it on principle or as a stance against shitcoins. So yeah, and also to backtrack a bit about 2014 with the disconnect between big blockers and small blockers is that like uh, a lot of the big businesses back then they but like people in general had this idea that on-chain transactions should be used for payments and such, like uh, having zero confirmation transactions. But as we have seen in the recent years and also in the recent months with the full RBF debate, like zero con transactions are dead now. Like we, sh we shouldn't try to think that it works because like in the long run, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be a good uh, idea. Like we need to to move to lightning or some other things, but probably lightning because then you have like final confirmation immediately as, as when it settles, right? So, um, so that together with like increasing the block size, thinking that we will make transactions on chain all the time was just a uh, just uh, like a, a misunderstanding of the technology back then because it was very difficult to really figure these things out that early like i didn't i didn't understand these things either i i was i was a big blocker for some time before i also realized that no like this really doesn't work like we need to try to find other solutions to this problem which is why i was very excited to see both side chains and also the lightning network like those two things uh were really interesting for me and and as you know i'm i'm making a lightning wallet now so i definitely is putting my my bet on that horse so so yeah yeah for context lots of people who are nowadays very big in bitcoin were big blockers up until segwit came along right for example yeah. if you yeah. read about jameson lop he talks about something like 100 megabyte blocks in an interview from 2016. Yeah. also Adam yeah, even core devs had the block yeah. size like even core devs had like crazy ideas. Like I want to put someone on the spot, but like Peter Will uh, was like 32 megabyte blocks in like uh, four or five years or something like that. Like just really like a quick uh, progression. Like the only one that had like a conservative like block size increase, which which was actually a block size decrease. Like uh, if it will be hard forked at that time, uh, uh, was uh, Luke Dash Junior. Like he. He projected like a block size increase, like maybe t 10 years in the future, like really, really, really like slow progression. And, uh, you know, that's maybe a bit too conservative, but like a lot of people, including myself, had crazy ideas back then. So I don't blame anyone, but I think that we need to uh, look back and try to understand things moving forward here. Uh, and yeah, and it seems like the big booker camp is basically a dying breed at this point anyway so yeah well it was useful to see why it fails they had for sure, all of, for sure yeah maybe not all but they had most of the concerns that we have expressed in terms of what can go wrong and they displayed them in practice it wasn't just concern for sure, trolling yeah. for sure like both both the culture of hard forking was interesting because like uh, Bitcoin Cash people have a culture of hard forking, which naturally led to the hard fork to make Bitcoin SV, Satoshi Visions as well. So, and we have like a pretty hard stance against hard forking unless it's like necessary, but they don't have that culture. So it was natural for me that they will hard fork and spin off to more coins. And also, you can if you look at Bitcoin SV that has like enormous blocks, like gigameg blocks, which is the meaning, right? Uh, they have like two nodes in the network now because it's just too much of a burden to run a node there. So that is like, of course, not good for the network health. So, so yeah, I, uh, keeping the block size low is 
is reasonable for multiple reasons reasons both for the centralization but also like eventually we'll need to have a functioning figure market as well if the block reward keeps going down so yeah i want you to explain something and we're gonna go back a bit to lightning network there is a certain type of transactions that moon wallet is doing and there was concern that it was bloating the mempool what right, is it? Yeah. Um, I think it's called like a summary swap. I'm not an expert in this, but the way I understand Moon is that like if you below a certain threshold, the the payment is actually just internally recorded with the Moon server. And it's basically a trust on their part that you won't steal the money. But if you go up above a certain threshold, um, I think it was around 30,000 Satoshi when I tried it, there will be uh, an on-chain transaction for each lighting transaction that you make. Um, I can't really explain the technical details uh, right now because I haven't like read about it for a while. But it's basically required in order to make the the payment in question because Moon is not a Lightning node wallet like Blixt, OpenBit wallet, and so on. Or it's just like a an on-chain wallet with a lightning port. Yeah, and I guess at this point, we should go back a bit to Blixt and ask you about the positive sides and make you, for the ones who are still here, after they heard all of that talk about technical criticisms uh, and what we think should be improved. So, no, let me ask this first. Why do you find it so hard to promote Blixt? Because it seemed like you're kind of neutral, being like, yeah, I developed this, but there are also <laughs> other wallets and we do this. Yes, we have this feature, but you never told anyone, yeah, you should download it because it's cool. So what's stopping you from promoting Blixt like that? Um, I mean, I, I guess I'm, it maybe sounds crazy, but I guess more like altruistic in this way, because like the threat I see is custodial wallets is basically custodial wallets versus self-custodial wallets so i see the self-custodial ones uh meaning breeze phoenix open with wallets as basically like friends let's say but um i still believe that blixt is the is the best of the bunch because it's so like flexible and it's such it has such a great blixt community with people helping out so i still think it's the best option if you want to uh, utilize and use lightning uh, but you know i i don't want to shit on the, on the self controller ones because we are all in an uphill battle against the the custodial bank uh, lightning wallets because as, uh, for an example if you look at noster they're basically all using custodial wallets like wallets of satoshi, wallet of satoshi and albi and there is like they're the self custodial wallets they're losing on the walkover right now because there is no alternative to have a lightning address uh, for a self custodial node wallet i mean except for my lightning box idea that we talked about earlier so so yeah, that's why i try to stay mild on the matter but you know i'll say blix this more in the open source ethos than perhaps breeze and phoenix because like they have they still they're still open source but they are more they're more like a company than blixtis like blixtis is more an open source product at this point rather than some commercial uh, company making a product so i'm trying to create an open source project so if that appeals to you you're welcome to install Blix and use it and also contribute via code or support for the people and users. So, yeah. Is there a business model behind Blix? How do you make money off of it? Or do you spend some of your own Bitcoin to develop this? I spend my own Bitcoin to develop, develop it. Um, we rely on crowdfunding. So we have a crowdfunding page on geyser.fund. Um, but I will, in the future, will probably take some cut from the services we provide or like when you do payments inside Blix, we maybe take like a 0.1% cut on payments like the others do. Uh, they're much higher than that, I think. But right now I'm just trying to 
promote Lightning Network as like a payment network, so uh, so people will use it rather than trying to benefit from it. So it's it's mostly altruistic at this point. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Kind of a strange motivation, don't you think? People will look at you and be like, "Oh, this guy is a spook. He thinks we should change Bitcoin." <laughs> And also, well, he runs the service and has no business model. <laughs> well, in the end, like if if people use Blixt or another wallet, it means that there is more value and more people using Blixt, which still benefits me if I hold Bitcoin. So it like there's a win. No, uh, so yeah, yeah, it's really impressive. You're just like Thomas Vogtlin from Electrum. Even though I guess he has yeah, more Bitcoin yeah. to fund it, but he yeah. still funds the wallet development from his own pocket, and you do that too. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not against doing it for profit. I just think it's not the right time to do it. Right, we're still in the growing phase, and there's no reach on to reach off of users right now. I just want, I just want want Lightning to grow because. That means that it will be even harder to stop it, right? If people start using it more and more. So that's why I don't really focus on that right now. I'm not sure if this is a stupid question or not, but there are certain transactions that are being routed by the Blix node. And yes. they might be using some of the channels that the users have opened. So what happens to the routing fees that are being collected? Do they end up in your pocket or do the users collect them um the users are not opening like uh, channels that are visible they're opening like hidden non -non -non private channels like, private channels yeah so so it's not so that's a privacy thing right they're not being seen in the network it's only the big snow that is seen in the public network so there's no yeah, the fees just the, the users just stays hidden basically, so they don't uh, get any routing uh, forwarding fee. Yeah, that makes sense. So I feel like I should also take the questions that you received from the audience, and I'll take Joko's question first because he wants to know why are you always dressed so poorly? Which I don't see. You're wearing <laughs> a coat and a nice shirt. <laughs> Um, I suppose it's just my style. I like dressing poorly, <laughs> let's say. Um, and it's also like if you do it once and there is a certain expectation, so I just try to maintain that expectation all the time. Uh, except when I go to the gym, then I won't have the, the suit and shirt anymore. But I just like classical uh, male men, men's fashion, like dressing in a more proper manner. So I do that like literally all the time except when I go to the gym. Yeah, I went to a libertarian conference last week and I noticed that they really like wearing suits and bow ties and looking oh, like okay. Rothbard. I see. <laughs> so I guess yeah, you I, I guess, I mean, Well, yeah, that's kind of interesting because like many programmers and tech people, they usually don't dress well, right? Because, but, but I'm actually like, I really like to code and program and do the, the low level stuff, so to say. So that's kind of interesting mix uh, there. I, I guess I'm a libertarian, but I don't really see myself in that group per se. I'm more like, I like the tech, the tech stuff. Yeah, you're a cypherpunk. So does, do, do you also code wearing a suit? <laughs> uh, maybe a shirt, but a suit can be hot sometimes. So I take that off, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, that that was a very important question for me to figure out because <laughs> maybe you feel that you're doing something more important if you dress up before you work. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I I mean, it's it's just I just like uh, this uh, fashion. Like people like to wear other clothes, and that's fine for them. But I think that you should dress in a proper manner. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, that's something that I heard also from the people from Maison Machi, which is a fashion house with stuff that's made in Paris. And they sell t-shirts for like 600 euro. And you can buy a t-shirt <laughs> with the V01 version of the Bitcoin code. And that's super nerdy. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Anyway, Christopher David wants to know what are your thoughts on LDK, which is Lightning Development Kit? 
right um i think it's interesting um like uh, i'm using lnd as we talked about and uh, i don't see any need to change to that for now because i am quite happy what we have uh but i if i recall correctly there is like an implementation to add uh, bolt 12 to lnd and that code is actually dependent upon ldk so if that goes true we'll probably have ldk inside blixt but it won't be for the actual lightning node it will rather be for uh, the bolt 12 uh, utilization basically to the only message routing and stuff uh, so yeah i think it's really cool uh, but no need for me uh, personally um, i know there is like a project to i think it's called uh, ldk node or something like that that's more like a finished package that wallet creators can use so that will be uh, beneficial because as far as i understand ldk in, it, in of itself is more like a library than, than rather than a like a full-fledged light node uh, i might be wrong on that but because when i started blixt in 2019 I looked at like how can I leverage as much as possible on other people like because I can't make anything myself. So then LND was the natural choice for me back then because and it still is because you have the neutrino SPV like the Bitcoin uh, SPV node and you have a full fledged Lightning node with a large developer community. So it just was just a natural choice and it's also made in Go lang low Go lang so you can easily build that for. Android, uh, iPhone, iOS, and, and other platforms, which you yep. can do with LDK as well. But yeah, I just that didn't exist back then anyway. So when I started it. Now I'm going to look at the Telegram chat for Blix Wallet. If you want to join it, let me see if it's public. Yeah, it's t.me slash Blix Wallet. You can join it. And you have 585 members, hopefully many more after they listen to this. And I'm going to give everyone who asked the question to you a shout out. The first one is Oliver Koblizek. I hope I did not botch your last name. And he wants to know, what are you most excited about in Lightning? And is there anything from a technical perspective that worries you about Bitcoin? Um, I will say that uh, the concept of stuckless payments is something I'm very excited about. Uh, so, briefly, what stuckless is like when you do a payment in Lightning Bay, your wallet will split up the payment in different shards and try to find like a uh, this like a path to the destination, the receiver node. But the issue is that if one of these shards gets stuck in the middle because there's a slow node and an unresponsive node that takes a lot of time to respond, it could lead to failed or slow payments because this node in the middle here just doesn't respond quick enough so you will have to wait until it responds and stuff so what stuckless lets you do is you burst out a lot of small shards and then enough of them just have to reach the destination it doesn't matter if two shards get stuck somewhere because as long as enough shards reach the receiver node you're good to go so it kind of mitigates the problem of having slow and unresponsible nodes in the network and I, I think we need stuff like this if we're going to use uh, lightning in like in the physical real world where we, where we, you can't just stay and stand in the queue all too long in a, like a grocery store and stuff. Uh, so that's one thing that really excites me regarding regarding lightning. Um, regarding uh, what's what was the second question? It was about Bitcoin uh, technical. Uh, yeah, yeah, something uh, that worries you about Bitcoin. Right. Um, I, actually, I actually think one of the biggest threats to Bitcoin right now is what we have talked about uh, previously in the show here. Like, uh, we need to try to change the culture surrounding uh, soft forks and like how we see Bitcoin. Like, uh, it, it is not perfect, and I think it's detrimental to the network if we not try to improve it uh, in man many areas, both privacy and scaling and so on. So. Like, uh, if you don't solve scaling, then that essentially means that we will have to rely on custodial uh, services and banks uh, if we don't, if we can't fix it on the base layer. And sure, that might be fine, but it's, it's it kind of a, like, a, it kind of sucks, right? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it will be better if we can tr try to make uh, Bitcoin as self-sovereign as possible and so we can use it uh, ourselves without relying on like institutions and uh, custodial uh, banks. And, uh, you know, there's some interesting possibilities like Lightning cannot be the scaling solution on itself. We can also try to do things like uh, side chains, drive chains, for example, BIP 300. Um, that could potentially be a scaling solution, which I, which I'm for, uh, actually. And there is also like this idea of zero knowledge proof rollups and stuff, but those don't work so well on uh, uh, on Bitcoin because of technical reasons, um, the way Bitcoin works with UTXOs. And then we also have like uh, the Fedimint Showman Cash thing. Uh, that is like a layer on top of lightning to scale. Um, but in any case, like we need to continue to work in these areas to try to make Bitcoin scale and make Bitcoin more private. I agree with that. I, I didn't ask you what you think about adding privacy to the base layer. If there's anything interesting that caught your attention. Yeah, it's... I think there is uh, some, uh, like if we get, the one interesting thing about cross input signature aggregation is that it makes coin join actually cheaper to use than making your transaction yourself. So that gives a huge incentive to actually do coin joins, which is quite interesting. Uh, so I will be for things like that for the, I mean, that's that doesn't need any change to the base layer other than cross input signature aggregation which shouldn't be a controversial thing to add. So I think that's a really good way to, to improve privacy and at least incentive to, to, for more privacy uh, without having to rely on fancy crypto. Okay, that's but actually also, a good also, answer. You mentioned yeah, Mimble Wimble also, earlier and I was expecting yeah. you to say something about it. Yeah, well, it's also like if you have one thing if it will, that is interesting, if you have side chains, for example, like a drive chain, um, you could potentially just swap into a drive chain, like a like a Mabel Wimble drive chain or like a Zcash style drive chain, and then just swap out of it again and benefit from the privacy functionality of that drive chain. Uh, so I think instead of adding things to the base layer, the main the main chain, having uh, different kinds of drive chains could be a potential privacy uh, fix. I very much agree with that. There is a conversation on the Blixt wallet telegram chat, which you can join. And there's someone, wait, his name is Rohan, who noticed that someone inscribed the Doom code in the Bitcoin blockchain. And basically Bitcoin can now play Doom. And he wants to know what, what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I I pers personally think that these things are kind of silly, uh, but it's also like it's kind of aligned with the Bitcoin maximalism view that I hold at least, uh, because it's I think it's better that people use Bitcoin and provide the transaction fee for the miners than they're using some kind of uh, shitcoin instead, uh, because like it's still use. It's still a use case to do these kinds of silly things. Uh, and in the long run, like if Bitcoin grows, like these transactions will probably be outpriced anyway. So it's not really a big deal. So yeah, so that's my view. I don't like it, but I'm still for letting them like, letting them do that those kinds of things. I very much agree with that, though. There are some developers who tell you, no, if you want to do stuff like this and that <laughs> arbitrary data to the blockchain, you should move to shitcoins. But then yeah, they're going to yeah, see that shitcoins uh, are scammy. Yeah, that's that's the thing, right? They can't they can't say both things because that's just that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. And I, I uh, tweet right. I really think that it's worth better that you use Bitcoin uh, because there seems to be some misunderstanding about the scaling things here because the. the Blockchain bloat is not the primary scaling concern. It's the UTXO database that is the primary scaling concern. So it doesn't. It isn't a big deal that they're abusing the uh, block space 
uh, box space available. It's just it's just annoying <laughs> if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. Darfcoin posted a GIF of a massive guy breaking a table with the caption "When blixed for desktop." <laughs> um, we'll see about that. There's so many things to do, but I hope to have uh, the Linux version probably read in summer somewhere. And for the, for the Windows version, probably Q3 or Q4. Uh, right now, I'm trying to fix the the lightning box things and all the other things that are in the short-term pipeline. But yeah, I, I'm really excited for doing desktop as well, actually. So yeah. I see that you mentioned that unless you get a lot of questions, you will never do an AMA on Stacker News. Why so shy? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more like if no one you asked asked you asked people in the chat group to uh, to ask questions for me. So if no one is asking, which few did in the beginning, I just said that if you don't ask questions, I won't do an AMA on Stack News. <laughs> but yeah, but it seems we got a lot of questions in the end anyway, so that's that's fine. Oh, well, there were like three of them, but yeah, still, uh, I, I'm happy that nothing. I gave the people a <laughs> shout out. They have an incentive to listen to this point. And if you did listen to this point, I guess you need to have like a secret word that you can write in the comments. What's the secret <laughs> word to prove that they have worked, the proof of work that they got to this moment in the podcast? Um, that is uh, Lightning Satoshi's vision. Lightning Satoshi's vision. It can be yes. LSV. You can also you do... Are. Yeah, you can also do hashtag LNSV as well. That's that's the that's the vision I had. It's like a meme for Blix. It's a vision for Blix, the Lightning Satoshi vision. But so, Satoshi yeah. never spoke about Lightning, right? No, it didn't. But it's it's like a play on Bitcoin SV. Like I have the Lightning SV for Blix there, how I see things. And it's basically trying to make uh, Lightning address and stuff like that the primary way we do payments in Bitcoin in Lightning. Because right now you rely on QR codes and Bolt 11, like invoice codes. But I'm a really big fan of, of using Lightning address and, and such things. So, yeah. How do you see the future of Lightning Network? Do you think that atomic swaps and all of the other stuff that was promised, for example, atomic swaps with Monero or whatever, do you think that's still in the books? Um, I don't know exactly what... That I mean, I, I guess you can do a atomic swap with Monero, but I, I think that it looks like uh, Lightning Network will be on Bitcoin and Bitcoin only, as far as I see it. And uh, I guess it's a cultural thing as well. But uh, I, some other chains have Lightning, but they're, they're very small or non-existent, basically. Um, I think we'll try to scale the Lightning Network itself and. It looks like we might have tokens on Lightning as well, which I am not a huge fan of with the RGB and Toro things. Um, but we'll see. I hope we'll continue to upgrade like uh, Lightning itself with, as I talked about earlier, the stuckless payments proposal because things like these will help with the reliability of the network, like for actually making payments. Because like, it's the one thing to be a routing node and try to earn money. And it's another thing to actually try to use Lightning as a payment network. Uh, and so that's why things like Stuckless Payments can try to mitigate the issue of someone just having a node in the network and not really caring if the response time is 10 seconds or not. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking what else I should ask you right now. I think I ran out of questions, which is unusual for me. <laughs> but I'm really proud of the project that you are developing. It's a labor of passion. You're doing it because you want to and because it's something that you want to use for yourself and not because someone demanded it or whatever. Actually, I do want to make one last mention. It seems like bear markets are always about saying, yeah, but Bitcoin is a network and it has other stuff other than the BTC token. And back in 2014 right, yeah. and 2015, it was about creating the first stable coin and creating counterparty, Omni, stuff like that for tokens on Bitcoin. 
And then in 2018, there were still people saying, no, 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 it's blockchain, not Bitcoin. <laughs> and now it's about, oh, no, we can put the US dollar on the Lightning Network. So it's not only right, about yeah. Bitcoin. It seems like bear markets are always like this, with people trying to justify the existence of the network with something else. What's your take yeah, on putting the US dollar, not just tokens, but the US dollar being transacted on the Lightning Network? Well, uh, like I like bit bit to see the unit. Like that's that's why I'm here. I'm not I'm not here for using dollars or something like that. Like we want to have bit to see the and the twenty one million block uh, twenty one million you know limit and so on. So I I see stablecoins as either a distraction or some intermediary thing for the time being, and I don't see it as a necessary thing or a good thing really in the long run uh, i think that we should focus on making btc the unit like bitcoin the thing that we use but as it's at the same time i of course understand that it's not really feasible for a lot of people uh there's they don't believe in btc the unit yeah so let maybe, me say what yeah. you cannot say because you're the lead developer of a project you want to grow a community I have no problem saying it, but if you use stable coins and you demand others to pay on stable coins, you're a pussy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a very good way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely agree on that. There are freelancers who are like, no, 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 don't give me Bitcoin. I want stable coin on Tr Tron or whatever. You're a pussy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, don't have anything to say about that. I fully agree. <laughs> Anyway, Hampus, it's really great that I had you for this interview. You should do more of them. And maybe in the future, when you I'll add more to. stuff to Blix, I want to interview you once again and discuss maybe for do sure, a live demo sure. when you release the desktop version and talk about what you integrated and how it works. That My be camera really cool. is also dying. It just oh, it's, yeah, I don't know. went offline, but it was nice to have you. Maybe I should let you have the closing word. Um, yeah, um, if you want to use, if you want to try out the Lightning Wallet, if you're a Bitcoiner that wants to go and try out Lightning, try out Blixt, go to blixtwallet.com and download the, the app for Android or iOS. Um, you can reach me at Hampus underscore S on Twitter, and you can also find my Noster public key from there. Yeah, I'll put them in the description. So goodbye. Close with the Are you concerned that your friends, neighbors, or KYC exchange might know how much Bitcoin you own? It is time to take your financial privacy seriously with Wasabi Wallet, a free and open source wallet solution which makes use of mega coin joins to mix your coins with those of hundreds of other strangers. Thanks to the groundbreaking Wabi Sabi engine, your coins get divided in smaller untraceable units, which grants you great anonymity for both huddling and spending. Download Wasabi Wallet 2.0 today at wasabiwallet.io and take advantage of the mega coin joins. It's free and it's open source, so don't trust Verify. CryptoSteel are innovators in Bitcoin cold storage. Back in 2013, they launched the CryptoSteel cassette, which made it easy to back up your seed phrase, passphrase, or any other form of private key on the sturdy metal which resists water, fire, and earthquakes. Today, CryptoSteel offers the Mother Load, an all-in-one box which endows you with everything you need to become financially sovereign. Inside of the mother load, you get a crypto steel capsule and a hardware wallet of your choice. All crypto steel products are engineered and manufactured in Poland. Order your crypto steel metal backup system today on cryptosteel.com and use promo code BTCTKVR at checkout 
for a 10% discount on your first order. Crypto Steel, secure your wallet seed phrase. Are you a writer, photographer, musician, or video creator who is trying to generate some revenue? Bumby is the Bitcoin way to monetize your content. It's more censorship resistant than any other platform of its kind with a low and flat one-time fee of 10%. Bumby is as easy to use as any social media mobile application. Sign up today at Bumby.com and subscribe for free to the Bitcoin Takeover account to get access to some time-exclusive content. If you are monetizing your creativity, why not get paid in Bitcoin for it? Bombi.com, the Bitcoin way to monetize your content. Shopping with your Bitcoin on the internet is easy. Shop&Bit is Europe's biggest Bitcoin store with over 800,000 products, ranging from Bitcoin books, toothpaste, mobile phones, computers, and watches. This month, I bought a Nintendo Game & Watch console with the classic Legend of Zelda and it arrived in only 5 working days. And if you can't find what you're looking for, Shop&Bit has got you covered. Their concierge service will get you anything and ship it worldwide. Additionally, they also have a travel hacking service that can get you the best deals on all things travel, flights, hotels, and more for business and for vacations. Bitcoin Takeover listeners get a nice discount, of course. Use code BTCTKVR on your first order for a one-time 5 euro discount. For more details, go to shopinbit.com. Shop in Bit, Europe's biggest Bitcoin store. <laughs>